On our newscast tonight, in Korea's ongoing battle against the MERS outbreak, the government plans to inject more than 45 million U.S. dollars towards efforts to eliminate the virus. And in Washington, Korean Foreign Minister Yoon byung se signs a revised civilian nuclear energy pact and meets with U.S. National Security Advisor Susan Rice to discuss the possible rescheduling of President Park Geun-hye's visit to the U.S. And some experts warn the Korean government needs to establish long-term measures to counter what could be the worst drought the country has seen in over a century. These stories and more coming up next. Hello and welcome to Primetime News on this Tuesday, June 16th. I'm Daniel Che. And I'm Hwang Jie. Thank you for tuning in. MERS, the number of MERS cases continue to rise. Four more infections were confirmed along with three related deaths pushing up total figures. For more, let's go to our Connie Kim at the News Center. Connie, what do we know about these fresh cases? Well, guys, three of these new MERS patients had contracted the virus while visiting the Samsung Medical Center, a major source of many infections, and one of the hospitals that announced a partial shutdown on Sunday. Now, these new cases are especially concerning because the patients had not been regulated by health authorities or Samsung Medical Center, which opens the door for possibly more infections. Now, one of them also happens to be the first MERS patient confirmed in Tegu. So health officials are tightly monitoring all the people the patient had contact with in order to stop the disease from potentially spreading nationwide. And as of now, seven regions have been affected by the virus. So far, a total of six people have been infected from tertiary patients, something the government has been worried about. And looking into the additional deaths added today, it's interesting to note two cases came from MERS patients who did not have a pre-existing medical problem. Now, this is raising eyebrows because most of the deaths up until now have been those who were already sick or the elderly. Also, the first death was reported in a patient in the 40s age group. Uh, the death toll could rise higher as 16 are reported to be in critical condition. Meanwhile, 5,500 are still under quarantine. And in an effort to contain the virus, the government has formed task force teams at 13 hospitals with MERS patients or that have been affected by the virus. Uh, there is some good news, though. Three people have fully recovered and were released from hospital today. And Connie, apart from forming a task force team, we task force team that is, we hear that the government is planning to funnel more money into the fight against the disease. Tell us more about that. Uh, well, just today, the government pledged 45.2 million U.S. dollars in reserve funds to contain the disease. It'll mostly be used by, to buy critical medical materials and equipment and to support medical and emergency service personnel. Uh, eliminating the virus is the most important goal in order to protect people's lives, but it's becoming even more urgent as it's already starting to take a toll on the domestic economy. Now, today, investment bank Nomura forecasts the outbreak will bring down Korea's growth by 0.3 percentage point to 2.2 percent this year. Now this as households are cutting back on spending while foreigners are canceling their trips to Korea. Uh, and Finance Minister Che kyung hwan will also have to decide by the end of this month whether to draw up a $9 billion supplementary budget to buffer any MERS fallout. Well, Connie, outside of Korea, there was one MERS patient reportedly died. Uh, he is also not of a Korean nationality, right? Right, Daniel. Uh, just a couple of hours ago, it was reported a 65-year-old German died this month of complications from a MERS infection. Uh, AFP reported that he had contracted the virus during, during a trip to the Arabian Peninsula in February. And quoting Germany's health ministry of Lower Saxony, the man died on June 6th of lung disease. Back to you. Thank you so much for that report, Connie. Moving on, uh, there is no known cure or vaccine for the MERS virus yet. That's right, but health authorities in Korea are crossing fingers for an experimental treatment. The results? Well, only time will tell. Shin Se-min has this report. 
patients 35 and 119, both of whom are in their 30s, have both received injections of an anti-serum comprised of antibodies and donated blood from two people who beat the virus. The health ministry's MERS control tower made the announcement Tuesday and said the patients are being monitored closely. The method has been used before, but not widely, and it's the first application of the immunotherapy for MERS in Korea. Scientists believe that the amount of antibodies in the blood of the survivor is greater than in others, leading to the use of this kind of immunotherapy for MERS. During the Ebola and SARS outbreaks, doctors used a similar kind of blood-based therapy as there were no readily effective drugs or vaccines available. And this is still used for new types of viruses with no cure, in this case, MERS. Experts say there haven't been enough previous clinical trials for plasma transfusions of the virus, so they are skeptical about whether it will actually work. It's a burden for the medical institutions in charge of the transfusions, as there isn't enough clinical evidence to support the idea of blood transfusions as a treatment for the virus. Questions about the treatment's effectiveness have also arisen because it was given to patients who were already past the early stages of infection. Normally, plasma transfusions are more effective when they're given right after a patient has contracted an infection, but the medical authorities wanted to find the best candidates for the treatment. So far, the patients in question haven't shown much improvement, but everyone's fingers are crossed that therapy will work. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Staying on the MERS outbreak, we normally say that if you're healthy, you will only suffer a mild illness once you contract the virus. Well, as our Connie Kim earlier reported, things appear to be taking a turn. Four MERS patients who didn't have any existing ailments have died, while two patients in their 30s are in critical condition. Our Han Daun gives us the details. A 61-year-old man who contracted the MERS virus while visiting his sick cousin at Samsung Medical Center and then passed away on June 14th from pneumonia. A 72-year-old woman who was hospitalized at Pyeongtaek St. Mary's Hospital and died on the 12th due to lung failure. Neither patient had a pre-existing illness. Patients 98 and 123 who died overnight on Monday were also free of any existing ailments. These four cases are ringing alarm bells with medical experts as they go against the conventional wisdom about MERS that it is not a threat to people who are healthy. The virus's incubation period of 2 to 14 days also seems to be breaking rules in Korea. Patient 146 contracted the virus from patient 14, known as a super spreader between May 27th and 29th, but it was 16 to 18 days before he started showing symptoms of MERS. And patient 149 tested positive for the virus about 20 days after first coming into contact with someone with MERS. As the virus is relatively new not only to Korea but to the world, Korean health officials are having a hard time trying to get a handle on cases like these. The incubation period is known to be from 2 to 14 days, but it can vary according to how you define the first contact or initial symptoms. Currently, patients in their 50s represent the biggest proportion of MERS cases, followed by those in their 60s and those in their 40s. But the number of patients in their 40s is on the rise. On top of increasing number of tertiary infections, cases like these that challenge the conventional wisdom on MERS are making it harder for Korea's health authorities to get a full picture of the disease. Han Daun, Arirang News. President Bakken had visited an elementary school and a middle school earlier this morning. Both of which have reopened after a temporary shutdown due to the MERS outbreak. Thanking the teachers and health care staff for their efforts to prevent the virus's spread and resume classes, the president asked that they help students and parents relieve anxiety by teaching them about proper hygiene. She vowed to do everything possible to eradicate the virus and explain to students that MERS is like a new type of flu from the Middle East and can be warded off with good personal hygiene and a healthy immune system. The World Health Organization recently advised local educators to resume classes since the outbreak was not directly linked to schools. Korea's 
Rival parties have failed to reach an agreement again on the confirmation of Prime Minister nominee Hwang Kyo-wan. Now, this delay is adding to frustrations over at the presidential office that's threatening to veto a revised law just sent to the cabinet. Our Ji Myung Gil has more on this sticky situation. Senuri Party floor leader Yu Sung Min says if the opposition continues to refuse to pass the motion on the appointment, they will adopt it unilaterally. The ruling party wants to hold a vote of the full assembly on the issue on Wednesday. Senuri floor leader Yu Sung Min has urged party members to be on standby for a possible voting session. The main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy continues to object to Hang's nomination, saying he is unfit for the job. The party's vice floor leader said Huang has failed to clarify the three big allegations against him, which are that he dodged his military service, he peddled his influence while he was a lawyer, and he engaged in tax evasion. The MPD said if members of the Senuri Party push the motion through unilaterally, then it will be like it was abandoning its legislative duty. The ruling party and acting prime minister Che Gyoan said that the vacant prime minister's seat should be filled and quickly, as the government needs to deal with other pressing issues like the MERS outbreak and a nationwide drought. Meanwhile, there is growing speculation that the vote on the confirmation is linked to a revised parliamentary law and that both are being used as bargaining chips by both sides. The ruling party wants to see Huang appointed as prime minister, while the MPD wants to see a revised parliamentary law approved by President Park Geun-hye. The opposition has repeatedly urged President Park not to veto the law, as the language has been softened to address her concerns that it was unconstitutional. The revision allows the parliament to request changes to government ordinances, including presidential orders, which President Park had threatened to veto on the basis that it could encroach on the government's executive rights and paralyze state affairs. The law was sent to the cabinet for the president's signature on Monday, but the presidential office still sees the law as potentially unconstitutional and has indicated that the president could still veto it. Kim young Arirang News. In other news, it was many years in the works, but South Korea and the United States finally put pen to paper on their updated nuclear energy cooperation pact. The deal still needs to undergo a lengthy review process by the U.S. Congress, but it's expected to take effect by the end of this year. Here's our Hwang Sung-hee with more. Korean Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se and U.S. Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz signed the revised Civilian Nuclear Energy Cooperation Agreement on Monday in Washington, ending four years of arduous negotiations. While the New Deal, updated from the existing 1974 pact, still bans Seoul from reprocessing and enrichment, it allows Korea to research a new technology for recycling spent nuclear fuel and to make low-level enriched uranium with U.S. consent. The agreement awaits approval from the U.S. Congress, but both sides said the deal strengthens their alliance. Together with uh, this uh, mutual defense treaty of 1954 mm -hmm. and the Coros FTA of 2012, uh, this will be one of the key pillars of our alliance. U.S.-Korea uh, 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 partnership mm -hmm. is an absolute anchor for uh, peace and stability. Mm -hmm. uh, in Washington, Korea's top diplomat also met with U.S. National Security Advisor Susan Rice to discuss the possible rescheduling of President Park Geun-hye's visit to the country. The Korean leader postponed her trip last week to handle the outbreak of Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, in Korea. Yoon said Seoul will push for a summit with U.S. President Barack Obama within this year at the earliest possible time. Hwang sang Arirang News. We now have more information about the North Korean soldier who crossed the border to defect to the South today. Aside from shedding light on the young soldier's journey, it's also triggering criticism over the South Korean military's lax border defense. Our Won ji has this story. He was the lowest-ranking soldier in the North Korean military. The 19-year-old, who shocked everyone on Monday by walking across the inter-Korean border, told authorities that he wanted to escape the harsh reality of life in the North. After questioning the young soldier, South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff found out that the private had run away from its barracks earlier this month after suffering constant physical abuse there. 
He told the authorities that he had traveled on foot and by vehicle for seven days to reach the eastern side of the border. Under the cover of darkness on Sunday night, he was able to sneak past the North Korean border control. And once he got close to the DMZ, he camped out near a South Korean guard post. Then finally, on Monday morning, he was found by a South Korean serviceman on patrol. The teen soldier immediately expressed his will to defect, bringing his eight-day ordeal to an end. The release of this information by the Joint Chiefs of Staff sparked widespread criticism regarding border security, as many questioned how the North Korean soldier was able to spend the night so close to a guard post without being spotted. In response, a military official explained that foggy conditions in the densely forested area had limited the view for border patrol. The teenage soldier remains under investigation by South Korea's intelligence agencies. Won ji -hyun. Arirang News. North Korea's weapons capabilities may have gotten a little more menacing. South Korea's defense ministry revealed today that the North has 13 different kinds of bacteria and virus with short incubation periods in its biological arsenal. Seoul said that if used by Pyongyang, they would most likely be carried by aircraft as the regime does not yet have the capability to fit biological weapons on missile warheads. Defense officials believe that anthrax and smallpox diseases with high fatality rates pose the biggest risk. In light of this, the ministry said it plans to acquire vaccines for both anthrax and smallpox in an effort to prepare for any biological threats from North Korea. Shifting our focus back south, South Korea is in the grip of one of the longest droughts to have ever affected the country. Reservoirs have receded and farmers are struggling to take care of their crops as rainfall has been half that of an average year. Our Kim Yamin explains why some experts emphasize it's necessary for the government to take immediate action to address the matter. Korea is stuck in a drought that some experts say could be the worst in over a century. While many researchers are still scratching their heads, some are leaning toward the theory that it's down to climate change caused by global warming. The Korea Meteorological Administration said Tuesday that accumulated rainfall in Seoul, Gyeonggi-do, and Gangwon-do provinces from the start of the year to mid-June was half that of an average year. Many experts say global warming is changing the length of the seasons, which has become a contributing factor to extreme weather phenomena, including droughts, typhoons, and heat waves. The nation's weather agency says it expects this year's rainy season to hit the central region in early July. Looking at the mid-range forecast, we are seeing less rainfall than normal, so the monsoon season will probably arrive later than usual. After analyzing the effects of climate change on the Korean peninsula, experts say that while the monsoon season might solve the drought for now, it's very likely Korea will suffer another extended dry period next year. They say the Korean government needs to establish long-term measures to counter droughts and the effects of climate change. In a related development, Korea's Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs said on Tuesday that it plans to set aside roughly 56 million U.S. dollars to provide water and aid to the agricultural industry. The ministry says it will work with local governments through the end of the month to find ways to supply water to affected regions, as well as come up with a comprehensive long-term plan to tackle the issue by October. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. And for other stories making headlines around the world, we connect now to our Paul Yi at the News Center. Our focus today, the Bush family makes another run for the White House. China reaffirms its land claim in the South China Sea. And the biggest names in the video game industry battle it, it out at this year's E3 Expo. Well, Paul, let's start in the United States. The former governor of Florida, Jeb Bush, has officially announced he is running for the U.S. presidency. He's paving the way for yet another notch in the Bush legacy. That's right. Jeb's older brother, George W. Bush, has served two terms as the 43rd U.S. president, while his father was the 41st U.S. head of state. Now, it's quite an unprecedented situation in American politics, but the younger Bush is clearly distancing himself from his family legacy and instead is trying to present himself as a Washington outsider. Speaking at a rally in Miami, the 62-year-old said he would seek the Republican nomination to run in 2016. He criticized the Obama administration's foreign policy, vowed to rebuild the U.S. military, and campaigned on a platform of immigration and education reforms. 
The presidency should not be passed on from one liberal to the next. So here's what it comes down to. Our country's on a very bad course. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? The question for me, the question for me is, what am I going to do about it? And I've decided I'm a candidate for President of the United States of America. Jeb Bush now joins an ever-crowded field of presidential hopefuls. Reports are emerging that business tycoon Donald Trump will also throw his hat into the ring. According to sources close to Trump, he will likely announce his bid on Tuesday at the New York skyscraper that bears his own name. And shifting to China, the country's foreign ministry says it will soon complete some of its land reclamation of disputed islands in the South China Sea. In an announcement Tuesday, Beijing indicated that it was close to setting up new outposts on the Spratly Islands, but stopped short of giving an exact timetable. We've already been quite detailed about the circumstances of the construction on some islands in the South China Sea. In terms of these projects, the situation is different on each island, and their completion times also depend on our designs. It's looking hopeful that they will be concluded in the near future. The Chinese government began stepping up its efforts to unilaterally create artificial islands in the contested waters last year, a move that drew harsh criticism from several Asian countries as well as the U.S. The Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Taiwan and Brunei also have overlapping claims of the South China Sea, which serves as a $5 trillion U.S. dollar shipping route. And finally, one of the world's leading of video game conventions has kicked off in California, giving gamers a sneak peek of the biggest titles of the year. The Electronic Entertainment Expo, or E3, is featuring a host of major industry players, including Microsoft. The company touted Monday sequels and remakes of popular gaming franchises such as Halo, Tomb Raider, and Gears of War. Today, we showed you the greatest games lineup in Xbox history. New and innovative games that speak to the boundless creativity from studios around the world. Blockbuster franchises you know and love. Trailblazing independent games from a new wave of creators who are redefining game development and game play. Not to be outdone, Sony unveiled the latest blockbuster games and cutting-edge hardware under development for its PlayStation 4 console, which is currently leading worldwide sales. E3 is set to run through Thursday at the Los Angeles Convention Center. And that wraps up our look at international stories for now. I'll see you back here tomorrow night. Due to instability in the atmosphere, many Indian regions received spread bouts of rain today. And it looks like more showers could be in store for tomorrow as well. And sudden downpours along with thunder and lightning could also hit here in the capital. So be sure to have an umbrella handy as you head outdoor. And tomorrow will be as hot as today for most parts. But eastern regions will notice much cooler temperatures uh, with highs hovering in the low to mid 20s and that's due to strong easterly winds. So on that note, let's take a closer look at tomorrow's temperature. Seoul will rise to 31 while Daegu and Gwangju get up to 27 and 29 and Busan climbs up to 24 tomorrow afternoon. And on to other parts. Daejeon and Jeju Island will see a high of 29 and 23 while Tokdo peaks at 22. Now the current heat wave will continue until Thursday with Seoul skyrocketing to a high of 32. But we have relief on the way on Saturday with a light rain in the forecast. Well, that's all for the weather. Good night.
And that brings us to the end of our newscast. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Hong Ji-hye. And this has been Daniel Che. Do join us again at the same time tomorrow. Goodbye for now.